Hi, my name is Gautam. I'm going to be speaking today on the art and science of forecasting. It's a pleasure for me to make this presentation uh, through NPTEL and I thank them uh, profusely for this. One thing I do want to use the Google link because that is the one that I will be uh, using so that I will look at it and uh, give you my responses, okay? Uh, I'm not able to respond to things that come on the chat. I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for being there and for uh, listening to my presentation. Uh, this uh, talk has, uh, uh, you know, the contents of this talk, uh, uh, I'm uh, responsible for. There are many things that a lot of uh, uh, amazing scholars have said. Uh, also, the presentation uh, is uh, due to my son, who did all the uh, excellent uh, you know, putting all this together. So uh, thanks to him as well. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, I would begin by saying a little bit about myself. I'm a professor uh, in the Industrial and Systems Engineering Department at uh, Texas A&M University. And uh, this year I'm on leave and uh, I work uh, for a big company called Amazon. Uh, but I want to say something that's very important, which is that anything that I say today is my opinion. And uh, these are things that are based on my perspectives and don't reflect what either Amazon or Texas A&M or anyone else that uh, you know, I've been dealing with uh, would like to say. So, uh, so uh, this is very important. And uh, also, you know, I think uh, anything that is said would be out of context if you said no, Texas A&M said this or Amazon said this. Okay, it was, it's me. Uh, I recently taught a course through NPTEL, and uh, uh, this course is called Decision Making Under Uncertainty. And if you see, this talk has a lot of flavor with respect to, to that. Uh, I would also recommend, you know, if you're interested, those of you that are students listening and looking to take a course, uh, this uh, may be something that I will teach again uh, in the fall semester. Hopefully, we don't know how things will go in the fall. Uh, if it does happen, then uh, we, you can definitely take it if you've not taken before. Uh, about 10 days ago, I gave a, uh, like this, another live session. It's called Lies, Damn Lies and Statistics. Uh, and uh, that, uh, if you have not seen, you're welcome to go take a look at that. So I've had some amount of experience. Maybe this doesn't show in my uh, presentation, but uh, uh, you know, we'll see how this goes. Okay, so let's start with this uh, little uh, data set that we have that I've plotted over time. So this is like a seven year data of monthly sales. So think of this as an automobile sale. I won't tell you exactly what automobile it is. Uh, the automobile sale goes down, then goes up, and then goes down, it goes up and down over time. Notice the x-axis is you know January of every year. So it goes up and down. Certain months there's a lot of sales, certain months there's less sales. So it goes up and down like that. So we tracked over seven years and pretend like we're here. This is, uh, uh, I think this is about November of, 2019 okay so think back a little bit in time november 2019 and we're trying to say okay how is this going to look like how are the sales going to look like in uh say december 2019 january february march april of 2020 so we want to forecast till the end of uh april 2020 so that's where uh, that's the problem uh, that we're trying to solve okay now if you think about it you know, the, uh, look at the pattern by which this uh, automobile sales is going. The pattern is kind of in going up and down. It's also it's a slight increase. So you will factor both those in and say, okay, my prediction or my forecast is kind of going to look like this over the next uh, five months, so to speak. Okay, so this is going to be what we're going to predict. And that prediction is mainly based on the patterns we've seen in the past, historical data, as well as uh, you know, what we think will going to happen in the future. But in this case, we basically only based it on past data. So let's see what happens actually. So it turns out that if you look at this data, in actuality, it does go up for a little while and then until January and then boom, come February, it takes a huge plunge. And then March, I'm sorry, March, it takes a huge plunge, April, even more of a plunge. Why did that happen? Obviously, the COVID-19 situation really brought the sales down dramatically. Now, this is an effect that is outside of this model. I completely agree with that. However, the important thing is to understand what is the impact of something like this, which we should be aware of, we should be cognizant of things like this potentially happening. Let me give you another example. Uh, this 
where some of us may be familiar with. So, uh, so we have two players who are playing a tennis match. Player A has a certain probability of winning. So think of this as uh, the height from this red line to the top is the probability that player A will win. And from the red line to the bottom is the probability that B will win. So the yellow color here is before the match starts. So before the match starts, uh, the probability is that each of them win somewhat flat. Nothing much changes. Uh, it could change a little bit here and there because you know, of various other conditions that uh, you may have heard. And then after a while, once the match starts, let's say B starts playing well, and then the probability that B is going to win starts increasing, going up, and then maybe they suddenly say, oh, he's not playing very well. Okay, the probability goes down, he starts to play well, probability goes up until this point, and then maybe wins a couple of sets, and oh, okay, maybe this person is gonna win for sure. Then all of a sudden, you know, A wins a set or two, then the probability goes down, goes up and down. So the point that I'm trying to say here is that over time, this probability keeps getting updated based on what you're seeing. So you're getting some feedback as you go and you're updating your probabilities. And then when the match ends, clearly B has won the game. Although they started with a, a lower probability of winning, they ended up winning the game. And of course, once you're here, a, B has won the game. So we're right here. Now, my point here is another thing as well. Many of us in, in reality, if you're a big fan of A, you're always sitting on this line. You're thinking you're always going to win until the actual boom, it jumps here and then goes right on the top. Okay, so that could happen to a lot of us if you're a big fan. Now think of a person who's not necessarily a fan of either player and you're just trying to assess the probability that a person wins or loses, then you have this, uh, uh, you know, you go on updating this probability. Let's look at another case. This is the population growth rate in 2006. Okay, so uh, this is from this uh, uh, website that's listed in the bottom. And uh, you see the various colors, you see in each country, what is the growth rate. Uh, and as you can tell, the growth rate is about 1% in India, uh, where most of these uh, of the viewers are right now. And then if you look at 2019, no, the life has not gotten worse. I, I don't want you to think that, oh boy, what's happened? No, the, uh, they changed the colors of their maps between 2006 and 2019. So uh, uh, they didn't know I was going to make this presentation, evidently. Nonetheless, this is where the numbers look like. About many countries, you know, change numbers a little bit. Some countries remain pretty much the same. In India, it's about the same. It's not changed a whole lot. Uh, but, you know, it's important to predict even a very small difference. Now, the question that we wish to ask is, what is going to happen in 2050, 2050? Can we predict and uh, what it's going to look like? That's, uh, now that's a forecasting problem. But this forecasting is a little bit different. You are continuously controlling the population in some sense. When you control the population and you're trying to predict, it actually becomes tricky. So what we typically do is if we don't control, this will be the population in 2050. And if we decide to control it, this is where we'd like it to be. And you build a lot of models to see what strategies and how to go about doing that. Okay. Now, if you want to uh, look at a completely different example, this is, uh, uh, you know, so we want to see what, how does bias bias, or what it biases, in, in, in other words. So Adam Grant, who's uh, an amazing uh, uh, author and scholar, uh, he had uh, this very recent uh, blog post called Job Interviews Are Broken in New York Times. Uh, take a look at it, it's a wonderful article. And uh, he makes two quotes in that, and that's why I put them in quotes. He says that, you know, there's this uh, 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 publication called Kansas City Star, and uh, they uh, rejected, uh, you know, Walt Disney of all people, and uh, when and he applied for a job. And if you look at other people like Beatles, Madonna, U2, Kanye West, and Ed Sheeran, all these guys took a long time to get somebody buy their, uh, you know, their idea, and then say, okay, we we'd like to uh, get you in. So in some sense, you could think of, huh. I wonder who was interviewing these people in the first place, okay? So he starts, Adam Grant starts his article by using this and then moves on, pivots, and then goes over to say, you know, in general, how do you go about conducting a job interview? Now think about this, this is also a forecasting problem. You would like to pick a candidate that's going to be useful to your organization, okay? That's the idea. How do you go about picking somebody who is excellent? Now, firstly, you have to always ask the right questions. These are the things that he says. You know, ask the right questions to the candidate. Many times we ask questions that, you know, fairly irrelevant to predict how they're going to perform in the job. 
The other thing is we need to overcome our biases. We say, oh, this guy is from this top university. He must be a great candidate. Let's just take them. Well, you could get biased that way. You, what you want to do is you want to make sure that you actually ask the right questions and overcome your biases. Not only that, you also want to look at what kind of past work have they done. Okay, Not just look at their resume, uh, but also look at you know, what kind of things that they've done. You can ask them, tell me a time when you did something, or how did you do this, and what are the different things that you've done. There are ways to ask questions in an interview to exactly get answers to that in order to be able to pre uh, predict or forecast how well this person is going to be at work. Again, I'm not saying that just because you did a great job that the person is going to be doing great. Just like in the example here that we saw with the tennis, your thoughts, if this person is going to be great or not so great, will keep changing over time depending on how they perform in their job. Okay, That's also another important thing. I do want to put a quick plug for Adam Grant's podcast called Work Life. Uh, this is definitely uh, an audience that would be interested because many of you guys were students are thinking about you know uh, going into the workforce and uh, this is a beautiful uh, podcast uh, that I would highly recommend folks to listen to. All right, so let's get started. Okay, uh, what is the scope of the session? Now, you, I really cannot teach a whole course on forecasting in in one hour. That, that's not going to happen. So we will take a quick, gentle look at what's going on. We'll see, you know, what's the various science that goes behind it. I won't go over too much of detail. I, uh, I'll keep it kind of at the level that we've seen right now. But the last two points are extraordinarily important. What does it take to be a great forecaster? Okay, so that's, uh, that's very important. What kind of a personal traits we're talking about? Okay, and uh, what are some good resources, books, or, you know, another thing, in my case, it's all books, uh, that you could do, use to become a great forecaster. So that's going to be the objective of this session. Uh, let's keep that in mind. And also let's keep in mind that a lot of the listeners are students who will uh, eventually be taking courses like this, uh, you know, or you know, there are a bunch of NPTEL courses that also talk about topics like uh, forecasting and uh, other uh, related items, okay? Okay, so let me begin with an example. Uh, so if you think about this non-renewable uh, energy, which is plenty in this day and age, and we're trying to get rid of that and move into more renewable sources uh, like wind and solar. But that has been slow. And one of the reasons that it's been slow is uh, the fact that there's so much of uncertainty and variability in the amount of wind and solar that you could get over time. Uh, in, instead, if you use a different type, you know, uh, you can easily control a lot of the other sources which are non-renewable, and that's why they're extremely popular. But when it comes to wind and solar, you cannot just make wind. I mean, then you'll be using power to make that. So in the first place, you need the wind that is coming naturally and can go up and down. Same with solar. You get a little cloud cover, uh, then the solar panel is not going to produce <clears throat> as much uh, energy as you would like it to. Now, how do you forecast the amount of power the solar uh, panel or the solar uh, uh, photovoltaic cell is going to produce? And if you can do a good job of that, you can be sure that <coughs> you could also utilize the non-renewable energy effectively. Okay. The other important thing that to think about is that you could say, okay, why don't you just get all the energy and store it in a battery? See, batteries are not at all efficient. Uh, a huge fraction of your energy gets lost if you keep converting and converting it back. So, so that is a major downside, but that's one of some of the things that people are working on to see if they can improve the efficiency of batteries. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, next, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, what happens over, you know, one month. So this is from way back, from 2012, where, you know, looked at one month's data uh, in October. And if you look at this, you know, on look at on October 2nd, Tuesday, which is Gandhi Jayanti, uh, the amount of solar power is almost flat. So presumably there was no cloud wherever this was taken. And, uh, you know, you had a clean, the amount of solar power goes up around middle of the day and then goes back down and then stops here. Whereas on the next day, it kind of goes up and down. And some days it's really down. It made a very cloudy day here. So is fifth and sixth. And it goes up and down that way. So if you think about it, the amount of solar power in a panel is significantly varying and uh, you wish to be able to predict this. So let's take a closer look. Let's see what happens, you know, when we zoom in on October 16th, that is right here, this guy, 
October 16th, and let's see what happens there. So the amount of solar power goes up, uh, there's probably very little clouds, and then it goes up and down because of cloud movements and, and so on. And you kind of see this, this pattern. Okay, and the question is, we want to be able to predict these things. Well, there's one time you can easily predict solar, obviously at night, right? You'll predict this to be zero. Yes, but we're not interested in that. We're interested when there is sun, what is going to be the amount of solar power? All right. So how do you go about doing that? What are the inputs to your model? And by the way, I'm giving this example for solar, but these inputs and models and forecasts apply to almost any type of time series type of situation. Okay, you have something going over time series is essentially a collection of data over time. Okay, and you have this historical data and you use that to do some forecasts. Okay, for example, in the solar case, you're just taking all the solar power that you've been observing in the past and then feeding it into a model that will give you a forecast. And uh, you also can get what is called exogenous variable. Right? It will be nice to know what is how much of clouds I'm going to get. Remember, when you have clouds, you have things going up and down. So you'd like to know how much of clouds am I going to get. Temperature also is a big factor. Uh, and also, the, when I say date, what I really mean there is, you know, some days of the year, uh, you have more sun, and some days you have lesser, and then, uh, uh, and so on. So there's going to be a, a factor of time of the year as well. All right. You could use those variables, and those are called exogenous variables, because they're not part of the time series. This is not just this data, but I'm also adding additional things like, you know, temperature, cloud cover, and all that. Those things can be predicted somewhat well. If you look at weather forecasts, they'll tell you whether it's going to be rainy tomorrow, it's going to be overcast tomorrow. We've been doing this for a long time. We have this kind of data. So you fit that into the model as well in order to make a forecast. Okay, so that's your exogenous variable. So you put in all this into your model and then make a forecast. Now the question is, what kind of forecasts you're going to make? And there are many, many things about forecasting. Depends on what you need, okay? Sometimes you will need a forecast that is averaged over 15 minutes. A lot of the markets are based out of 15 minute slots, okay? So in a 15 minute time slot, how much of solar power am I going to get? You could also think of the, doing certain predictions at every hour. Okay, so you want to go ahead and do that, or maybe even every four hours uh, and so on. So how, how you want to average over, and we saw the automobile data was averaged over one full month. Okay, so it depends on what you want to do and what, how you want to use it for. And when do you want to forecast? We're looking at maybe the next 15 minutes, that's one way to think about it. We could think about maybe tomorrow uh, around the same time, which is about uh, 6.45 uh, in the evening. Uh, in India, or maybe we are talking about next month. We want to do some planning. Okay, you could. We want to do it in advance. We want to think about it later in the year. So, when do you want to do your forecast for? So, there, there are two different questions, right? One is, what is the granularity? You want to predict for how long, and when do you want to start your prediction? Okay. Now, the next question is, how much time? Is that just one slot, or are we looking at ten time slots? Okay, we're looking at what is the prediction for. A 15 minute prediction for the next, you know, four 15 minute interval. That is the next hour you predict in 15 minute intervals. So, for how long you want to predict. So, these are all questions that you want to ask. And the other thing is what kind of forecast you're going to give. You're going to give you a point forecast, a single number with maybe a confidence interval. This is just a little error bars around it to say, okay, this is going to be a value, but a little bit of error, plus or minus so much. Okay. Or are you going to give a probabilistic forecast? You say, okay, there's going to be a 60% chance of rain or something like that, or an ensemble forecast. We will talk about both these items a little later uh, in today's talk. So if you haven't followed this, it's okay. We will get to it. Now, what are the types of modeling? Now, this is uh, especially for statistical forecasts. Now, there are other types of time series-like forecasts. There are other types of forecasts we'll get to later which will may not use some of these techniques, okay? So the, the set of techniques that are called time series based, look at a time series, so this is very uh, fairly traditional, so to speak, is to use a method like exponential smoothing and REMA. And both these methods do use two things. One is trend, where the things are kind of trending. The sales of vehicles are kind of going up over time. There's also seasonality. Certain months there's more sales, other months there are less, lesser sales. Same with the ARIMA model. ARIMA stands for Auto Regressive Integrated Moving Average. Okay, so, uh, so that model as well 
uses tend and seasonality, but ARIMA is also capable of using exogenous variables, so it, uh, uh, it kind of adds to the uh, ability to predict. You could also think of a variety of hybrid models. These are models that are beyond all this, use some amount of uh, regression and so on. We'll get to the regression word in a moment. But there's also other methods uh, based on physics. If you look at weather forecasts, they're very physics. There's also a lot of statistics in there, but there's also a whole bunch of physics. They actually compute what will be like the next day based on actual you know, fluid uh, dynamics type of models. Okay, So that is uh, also a way to do some of these predictions. Then, what is getting popular this day and age, those of us that are working on topics like uh, you know, machine learning and uh, uh, data analytics, notice that there are many methods that also can be used from that. You can use some type of regressor, some type of basically you know, various versions of regression uh, to do your predictions. After all, regression is a predictive method, right? You have a lot of historic data, you build a model, and then you're asking the question, if with this model, this is my prediction, and future, if you see something that you've not seen in the past, then you're asking what's going to be the effect of that. So you could potentially do something like that. There are other methods, like random forest and gradient boost, that will do a great job of uh, predictions as well. We will not get into these methods, including deep learning and neural networks. I mean, these are up and coming, and there's a lot of uh, uh, nice courses on these topics. And you can, once you take them, you'll be more comfortable in figuring out how these models work. I'm going to stick with the first three models, which are time series based, through the rest of this presentation. All right. So we talked about this trend and seasonality, right, in the previous slide. So this is what I mean. So look at this. This is this this data is slightly different, uh, but somewhat uh, similar to the thing that we saw earlier about this um, automobile data, where it goes up and down. You know, has kind of has a weekly pattern, but uh, uh, also, the, the numbers are kind of going up. This going up business is what's called trend, okay? And uh, you see here between January 1st and February 26th, uh, the demand for certain item has kind of gone up. We didn't see a massive jump uh, because still COVID hasn't occurred, I think, in most parts uh, of the world at this point of time. So it's kind of going up slowly. The other thing, so you adjust for that. So it's called a detrended demand. So you remove the trend and this and you flatten it. Uh, a little bit, uh, and uh, it just kind of looks like this, and so now there's no trend here. Then you add in the seasonality. It goes up and down because you had like a, like a sinusoidal curve, like a thing, and it gives you a seasonality effect. And once you remove the seasonality, what you get is what's called error. So, you know, you could go, then this, notice these numbers are much smaller. This number is zero, this number is 20, Whereas here we're looking at the hundreds, okay? So once you remove the effect of trend and effect of seasonality, what you have is what's popularly called noise, okay? So these are called error terms. And these cause the variability in predictions, uh, at least that's what we'd like to believe, all right? So, uh, so this is just some amount of background and just to tell you what is trend and seasonality. These are two extremely important words that are frequently used in forecasting. All right, we're about the midway point. Uh, in my presentation, midway in terms of number of slides, not um, this is which is standing at about 19 right now. This is not midway in probably in terms of time. I'll probably go for another half an hour. Okay, <clears throat> the science behind forecasting, like we saw, is heavily based on statistics. And like I said, I don't have that much of time to go into the details of all the statistics behind this. And what we will mainly focus on is, you know, what what is, as an individual, what we can do to become good forecasters. So in particular, we're going to see how science is, you know, um, is nicely uh, helped with all kinds of art in here. So you like to see patterns in your data. You'd also like to understand what assumptions you're, you're making, right? I mean, that's very important. It, it is, if this was a complete uh, science without any art, you could easily have a machine kind of do this and make predictions. Uh, many times it's not as simple as that. So you need to understand the assumptions. Then which model to choose? Model selection is not is not at all easy. In fact, when we are doing some of these projects, different models work at different times for different parts of the system. It's, it's actually quite tricky to pick the right model. The other thing is, how do you develop an intuition? Okay, and, how, uh, and that is, again, a very human thing. It's a very artsy thing. Okay? And... 
finally, the most important thing is given all this data, you know, you think, oh boy, there's so much of uncertainty. You still have to make good decisions. You still have to make confident decisions. And that is certainly uh, an art. All right. What are we going to see next? We're going to talk about a very important item. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about accuracy of forecasts. Then we're going to look at different types of forecasts. We, we touched upon that a little while ago, and we're going to give a little bit more details about that. Then I'll talk about some wonderful reference materials, and uh, I'll, I'll end the session uh, talking about what makes, you know, what does it take to be a superb forecaster? Okay, so we'll do that. Okay, so now time to talk about accuracy. Okay, so you know many times it's very interesting that certain types of forecasts we are like you know we just take it we don't even question the accuracy when especially when you have an expert or a pundit I'm putting it in quotes because you know, these are not true experts they are just people who come on TV and then say something you don't question them you don't ask them you know hey how accurate have your past forecasts been and uh, that is. You know, it's just because, you know, we just think of them as, okay, these are experts, these are pundits, they know what they're talking about, okay? Sometimes we find ways to justify, think about astrology, okay? So, uh, say an astrologer predicts something and they're saying, oh yeah, we make all kinds of excuses to make sure that those forecasts are reasonably accurate. Okay? We, we do that a lot. In sports, oh boy, if you think about it, you don't even question this. If you think about it, when you do seeding, somebody seeded 1 through 64, for example, in Wimbledon, you kind of seed them that way. And, or is it, uh, yeah, I think it's 64. And then they play 1 play 64, 2 play 63, and so on. And then they keep playing this until the very end. In some sense, the people who are seeding are actually forecasting. And we don't question them. When the number 3 plays number 4, number three plays, say, a number 17 in the final, we don't say, oh, that was a very poor way of seeding. We, we don't think about those things. At least most of us don't, okay? And in fact, we always want the one who's lower seeded to win, okay? We want the underdog to actually win. We root for them, especially when you're not a big fan of any particular player. So sometimes, like I said, we don't question the accuracy of forecast. There are other times we're incredibly critical of forecast. Say, for example, elections, okay? If someone says, this person is going to win and then that person does not win, you get a lot of flack. I think that was pretty much just a career-ending uh, move for a lot of people, okay? Uh, the other thing is weather. You know, I, I don't know, if, uh, some of you may be really young. Back in the days uh, when, you know, the weather forecasting wasn't all that great. You know, when the forecaster says, uh, tomorrow it's going to rain, sure enough, that's the day we're going to take and do some outdoor activities because if that guy said it's going to rain, there's no chance. Okay, but things have improved a lot, though, a lot by uh, these days. Of course, we are in the COVID situation. I should talk about pandemics. People are making all kinds of predictions, but think about this. You get a prediction wrong, people are extremely upset. It's very hard to predict, by the way. It's very hard to predict when the pandemic is going to end, okay? Uh, and, uh, uh, and we're going to be extremely critical. People say, well, by this date, we'll all be back in the streets. Things will be going back to normal and didn't happen, you know, it gets a lot of uh, anxiety for people. Okay, stock market, this is another item where, you know, if you, you lose a lot of money if you uh, did not forecast well, so if your uh, uh, advisor told you to do something and things go wrong, you get really mad at the person. So, uh, so sometimes, you know, we are extremely critical of forecast. Now, the thing that we need to do is to firstly be concerned about the accuracy of forecast. How do you measure accuracy, right? So you have to take what the forecast was and what happened actually. One metric for that is what's called MIP, Mean Absolute Percentage Error. That's one way to actually look at. There are other metrics we'll talk about later. Uh, then uh, uh, you also need to give multiple chances and see the success rate. Just because somebody predicted something once and then say, okay, one chance and you're out, that's, that's not the right thing to do. You have to give people multiple chances and then compute a success rate as over a whole bunch of um, trials, okay? All right, now I'm going to speak about different types of forecasts. There are different types of different types. We are just talking about the specific time series forecast and in that a very specific two different types of forecast is the output variable in the in the picture we had a little while ago so think about this so if your outcomes and you know this gets a little bit hairy and technical uh, but i'll try to keep it uh, fairly generic so let's say you know thinking about like who's going to win a particular match or who uh, or 
you're going to win a tournament okay even better instead of who's going to win the tournament okay you're going to pick a particular player or who's going to win an election uh, especially in india when there are multiple parties you know we're going to think of which party is going to win the election or whether tomorrow's weather is going to be rainy or not rainy whether you have to carry an umbrella or not okay so these are discrete outcome okay, you can have you can count them in your uh, in your fingers who is going to win the match who is going to win the election there are only a few options and you can count them on your fingers so it's, we're going to call them discrete outcomes how do you pick the winner usually i'm not saying this is the only approach usually you pick the one with the highest probability so among all the candidates the candidate which has the highest probability of winning you're going to pick them as the winner okay that's how you make a point forecast so remember you want to make a point forecast just one number you want to give you want to pick who's going to win this tournament you're going to pick one particular player okay generally you will pick the one who has the highest probability of winning okay uh, then rain or not if the probability of rain is high you're going to say yeah, tomorrow is a rainy day okay if the probability of rain is small you say tomorrow is not a rainy day how do you measure well you you make the prediction and then you see how often you are right okay so the percentage of successful forecast is going to tell you how accurate you've been now if you think about other types of forecast you're looking at outcomes that cannot be counted on your fingers you know they could either be all real numbers which is really nasty or even roughly continuous even but numbers that are fairly large if you think about it you know how much of solar power now that's going to be a real number and uh, so you cannot put in one number you're not like picking this particular person you, you have a whole set of numbers to pick from and or sales volume how many are you going to sell okay uh, and uh, that also although it is discrete in some sense but it's not hand countable it's a lot of numbers that you can take then what do you do this is what is typically done in those situations you predict the approach to do that is you predict what is the mean what's the average okay what is the expected value or you pick the median which is the midpoint so these both are uh, central tendencies of this distribution of values that can be taken and you take the mean so this is commonly done when you get a bunch of numbers that you need to forecast like the solar power or sales volume this is often done okay and then how do you measure well you can measure how much you are off by looking at the mean error even better would be mean absolute error because you could whether you err on the uh, conservative side or on the aggressive side is an error nonetheless or you can look at root mean squared error mean map which i talked about a little while error but you need to use multiple forecasts you need to multiple you can't just use one value but you see this over multiple forecasts and then see how well they've done now there is the other type which uh, is not common you probably have seen one or two types of probabilistic or ensemble forecasts but this is getting more and more popular especially with the big data revolution people are now talking about probabilistic or ensemble forecasts okay now i tend to use probabilistic in the first case when you have discrete and i tend to use ensemble and continuous although i think the literature does not say so okay now if you think about it now we are saying the same situation we're looking about the players in in a tournament we are looking at a bunch of contestants in an election or we're looking at whether rains or not this is the same sets that we are going to be predicting but we're not going to actually tell you who's going to win or who is going to uh, or is it going to rain or not but we're going to say what's the probability so instead of giving a specific you know instead of actually forecasting the value we're just forecasting the probability okay so we are just saying this is going to be the probability that this player will win this is the probability that this player is going to win or this is the probability that this party is going to win the election and so on all right uh, same with rain we'll see that example in just a moment okay we will see the probability of rain and so on now then what you do is then the methods get a little bit more tricky uh, uh you know uh, so we will we will look at a little bit of that uh, in a in a short while especially with rain uh, but it's possible to predict same with continuous if we look at solar power and sales volume instead of just predicting the mean why not to predict the entire distribution or you predict percentiles that means you know the 10th percentile means there's a 10% chance that the amount of uh, say sales volume will be less than or equal to that 10th percentile or 90th percentile is going to be that there's a 90% chance that the volume is going to be less than or equal to that number okay so that's what is a percentile we will look at these two in just a little while and you use metrics like a pinball loss function to actually compute the accuracy of those forecasts all right 
Now we just talked about this rainfall, so we will forecast precipitation. Yes, in the U.S., precipitation includes snowfall and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, nonetheless, we're back in India. So this is a data that I pulled from uh, weather.com. And uh, if you look at uh, Chennai, uh, look at the next 10 days after I took it on May 4th. This was a few days ago. And you look at your uh, precipitation forecast. So just look at this column. I know you're tempted to look at other columns. Know these numbers. You know, I know some of you are thinking, boy, it, was, it is so hot. It really feels like we're almost boiling. No, no, this is Fahrenheit. It is, uh, uh, you know, still not, you're not, not nearly boiling at this point. Nonetheless, let's look at the precipitation. So uh, you can look out and say, you know, there's a 10% chance that it will be rainy today. This was predicted on the 3rd. Okay, on May 3rd, it was predicted. And uh, it said that, these are the probabilities. So you give these numbers, you give a probability of precipitation or probability of rain. Uh, in uh, When it comes to Chennai, it's basically rain or that, that, that's your uh, prediction at this point of time. All right. And they also describe it. They say isolated thunderstorms sometimes. So, so we want to get this number. Okay. So there's a wonderful paper by a friend of mine, uh, Eric Bickle, uh, with uh, Seong Dae Kim, uh, which was published in Monthly Weather Review. And uh, what he did, uh, they, I mean, they did is they looked at 42 locations in the U.S. over 14 months and looked at the data and uh, analyzed it. And what they found was the next day forecast. Now, notice here, we're not just doing next day, we're doing a 10-day forecast. We're forecasting for the present day, the next day, the day after that, and so on. So we're predicting over 10 days. So just the next day's forecast is reasonably accurate. That means, what does that mean? And this is the part that I want you to understand very clearly. Let us say they said there's a 60% chance of rain. Okay, what does that mean? Well, if there were 100 days in which the weather forecast said 60% chance of rain, okay, for the next day, and you can just look at your data and say, did it happen roughly 60% of the time, right? This is what it means. Let me just repeat that. Uh, so let's say you had 100 data points where they had made a prediction of 60% chance of rain. What you'd like to see is that when you look at the actual data, 60% of that 100 times, you're going to see rain. Okay, and did that happen? And that is roughly true. And that is what they mean by the prediction. So there is a 40% chance every day that it will not rain. But over time, if you look at it, 60% of those predictions would end up being rainy. And that's the meaning of this prediction. And uh, some of you may wonder, what, what does that mean? How do, you, how do you go about using some piece of information like that, which is something that we will talk about in just a moment. Okay? Now, there's a, there are two other interesting things that the authors observe. Firstly is there's a slight bias towards precipitation, especially in the warmer months. Why is this the case? Let's think about that a little bit. That means in warmer months, you're thinking you're giving a slightly higher number for chance of rain. The reason is, a lot of people tend, especially in the U.S., tend to be outdoors in the warm season. And uh, therefore, they, they, they give instead of, let's say, for example, it is 80% chance of rain, they push it and they say 90. Just so that, you know, people are not planning things. Ah, the 20% chance, I take a chance. You want to make them feel like, oh, let's not plan some outdoor activity. So they kind of bias it slightly towards that. This is very interesting information. The other thing they do is, let us say there's a forecast beyond six days. You saw the previous picture, right? You had 10-day forecast. After six days, they never avoid, They never give you 50% as a number. The reason is, from a human psychology standpoint, if you say 50%, that's like, you know, you're not even taking a forecast. You have all these complicated models. They pay you tons of money. And all you're saying is 50%. I could toss a coin and figure that out. So, uh, so there's a psychologically 50% does not sound reasonable for something that you know they've uh, taken a lot of trouble so they just avoid giving 50% that's an interesting tidbit that you'd get from this paper all right so let's move on let's see uh, this ensemble prediction business or ensemble forecast so uh, if you think about it uh, Let's say you want to ask a question. I'm going to ask, okay, let's say there's a match that's going to happen uh, in, in, in September. Okay, let's just pick a time that's much later than today. I'm going to ask you the question, what, how many people are going to watch that match? Okay, how many people are going to be able to watch that match? This is including, let's say, TV if you want to. Let's say you want to predict that. Okay, uh, What number are you going to give? 
Okay. Now let's say another question, more technical. Let's say you want to figure out you know, how much solar panel, I mean, how much energy a solar panel is going to give in one hour. You're going to ask, okay, how much is this going to give? You're going to predict. You're going to buy a solar panel. You don't know. And you wish to predict how much is it going to give in each hour. Let us say even harder problem. Let's say the particular location that is prone to earthquakes. Okay, you're ask, going to ask, when is the next earthquake going to occur? If you try to answer any of these three questions, you can almost certain, you can be almost certain that you're going to be wrong. Okay? And probably way, way off. You'll say there's going to be an earthquake in one year and then you'll find there's one, there's nothing in the next 10 years. Okay? Something like that. So you could be way, way off. So then what do you do? There's no point making a single forecast in all those situations. What you need to be doing is to give a distribution. For example, you could say something like the number of people that will be watching the match is going to be 1 lakh on average with a standard deviation of 20,000. So that is one way of thinking about it. Another way is, especially in the solar panel situation, is to say the following. The 10th percentile is 12 kilowatts. The 75th percentile is 62 kilowatts. What does that mean? Well, there's a 75% chance that the amount of solar power you're going to get is less than or equal to 62 kilowatts. Or the, there's a 20, less than, uh, a tw I'm sorry, uh, for this 24 number, because the number 24 and 25 are so similar, I got a little bit confused. So the chances that you will get less than or equal to 24 kilowatts of power is going to be 25 percent. Okay, that's what these percentiles mean. So, this day and age with the big data and everything, people are very interested in making these types of forecasts. This is called, called ensemble forecasts. Now, that's wonderful because you have all kinds of data. What's the point in just giving one number? Okay, say for example, here if you're thinking of giving the 50th percentile 53, well, you could be way off if it actually gave you 89 or 95 kilowatts. Okay, so uh, so you'd like to give an entire distribution. The question is, how do you test that? It's much harder to test, and I, I don't have uh, the resources to talk about those, but two popularly used methods, one is called the pinball loss function, or a more generalized version of that is called the continuous rank probability score, or called CRPS for the first letters of that. Okay, you may want to look that up. Okay, now to some of the things that I do a lot of, which is decision making under uncertainty. Let's think of this problem. Let's say one you are a news vendor, uh, there is you know, a street corner that is trying to sell newspapers. The question is, how many newspapers do I want to stock every single day? If you know the probability distribution of the demand, it really helps, right? Because if, you, if there are the number of uh, newspapers that are going to be demanded is extremely high on a particular day, you would wish to stock a lot more. If it is low, you will stock less. Why do you want to do that? Well, if you had too many newspapers, but too few people came in, then you're going to waste a whole bunch of papers because we're generally assuming that a paper uh, is not worthy the next day. Okay? If you stock too little and you had too much of demand, then what happens is uh, you have uh, lost opportunity for sale. So the question is, you know, if you use the probability distribution, we'll actually see that in this course, Decision Making Under Uncertainty, how do you use the probability distribution to make this decision about how many newspapers to hold? Now, it turns out that not just under this situation, but even for regular inventory decisions, how much of inventory to carry, even if the item is not perishable, like a newspaper or fruits and flowers and, and so on, you want to do this type of modeling. Many companies or many organizations uh, use what's called the 90th or 93rd or 95th percentiles to stock. That means the chance that you will, uh, you know, you actually have more than what you would need on average, right? You want to stock the 50th percentile. You stock a lot more uh, than the 50th percentile, which is rough, which is the median, which is roughly, cl generally close to the mean, but not equal to. Uh, instead, you would have a little bit more. How much more? This is roughly how much, what is typically done. Okay, and all that is based on the analysis that we saw here. Okay, okay, and. Uh, uh, the even situations where you don't do repeated. Now, this, these make a lot of sense if you make repeated decisions. But people also use distribution in situations where the decisions are not repeated day after day or hour after hour. Okay? Now, how if you're 
cannot take my course or are interested in looking at decision making under uncertainty for situations that are not so time series oriented this is a wonderful book annie duke has a beautiful book called thinking in bets making smarter decision the book talks about how you would you know make forecasts and then make a decision based on the forecast and stick with the decision the thing that a lot of us make is you know we uh, we say okay it's it, uh, we make a decision and then it goes wrong and then you get really upset that's not the right thing to do because once the uncertainty is revealed once you know what happens the next day you're saying oh that is bad but when you made the decision you did not know that information so this you should not be questioning your decision after the uncertainty is revealed and annie duke does a beautiful job uh, in the book talking about you know uh, how you should go about making good great decisions using all kinds of data and also how you should not question your decisions after the fact okay all right talking about these books i will wrap up my talk by talking about a few wonderful pieces of literature the first one i want to hit uh, is uh, this book uh, by heinemann and uh, athanasopoulos uh, which is called forecasting principles and practice if you don't pick any other book on time series data this is one book fortunately the entire book is available for free online you can just go to this website download the book and learn everything about this topic and this is pretty much what i did frankly there's also a chapter in there on judgmental forecast when there's no historic information available this is something that a lot of you might have questions what happens if you don't have historic data how do i go about making a decision well uh this talks about uh you know in chapter 4 how do you make forecast not decisions how do you make forecast in the other chapters are all about time series okay uh and uh, they use a software called r in their book but there are also python libraries available in various other websites if you are if you like python uh you can go use that uh they also have tremendous number of real life data sets in fact part of the course you can just take those data sets and actually analyze them i really recommend that and heinemann has a beautiful blog called hindsight which is on his website he also has the entire website with a lot of interesting articles you should take a look at this if you don't do anything else okay now next two uh, books are uh, more uh, are less of statistical or time series based analysis but it's uh, it is still statistical uh, but it's very interesting uh one is uh, this author called Nate Silver Nate Silver uh, rose to popularity due to all his predictions in elections he did not predict the most recent US elections uh, exactly uh the way it happened however uh, he wrote a beautiful book called the signal and the noise why so many predictions fail but some don't he essentially says that i'm quoting him we have a prediction problem we love to predict things but we aren't very good at it okay So what happens is he also says that when we have too much of information this is especially true with the big data situation we have a lot of information so it is in the covid situation this book was written way before covid okay so we take shortcuts by only picking selected data we pick some things and we ignore the rest think think we're doing this over and over again with covid if you think about it and then we make friends with people who are similar to us and we don't like the other people so this is one of the problems that we face i'm continuing uh the book also says that uh the reason we fail to predict is because we focus on the signals that tell a story as we would like it okay and not how it actually is the other thing is we ignore some of the risks that are difficult to measure even if they pose tremendous amount of threats now think about covid this is actually tremendously true then we also make very crude approximations and assumptions of the world again extraordinarily true with the current situation right we hate uncertainty okay uh, yes which is definitely true uh, i hope you don't hate the people who work on uncertainty as long as you just un- hate it that is but then you know when that is the actual problem is not a good thing to do okay and then the the book actually eventually goes about and it's not a whining book but a book really talks about strategies to overcome that and make great predictions and nate also has a uh, website called 538.com and it has all kinds of topics in there so if you want to look at uh, great predictions you take a look at that it especially covers the current situation with the coronavirus 
as well as uh, politics and sports and economics. It's, it's a very nice site. You should look at that. Okay, now uh, the most uh, important part of uh, the presentation is, you know, how to become an excellent forecaster. This is a brilliant book. Actually, when I gave this topic to NPTEL, I did not realize that I had used the art and science in my title as well without actually looking at uh, this book. It is actually called Super Forecasting, the Art and Science of Prediction by Philip Tetlock and Dan Gardner. Uh, in fact, one of the things you can read these two quotes, it says, how predictable something is depends on what we're trying to predict, how far into the future, and under what circumstances. We touched upon those things earlier in this talk. Foresight is the product of particular ways of thinking, of gathering information, and of updating beliefs. Okay? So remember, you're continuously updating your beliefs. In the tennis situation, you're going on changing, you know, what's the probability that A will win and B will win. The book, Tetlock's work, I think prior work for the most part, classifies people into two groups. One is called the hedgehogs. These are, uh, hedgehog is one that knows really well about one thing, okay? Foxes know, uh, have different strategies, know multiple different things. And uh, so these are what we traditionally call as an expert. And this is what we traditionally call as a jack of all trades type of a situation. And, uh, you know, there are, he's not saying one is better than the other. Both are very useful. And uh, it talks about, you know, differentiates that uh, in the book. When I say he, mainly because Tetlock's work is, is based on that uh, situation. Okay. There's also an appendix called the Ten Commandments for Aspiring Super Forecasters. You should read that. Don't go to the very end of the Ten Commandments. Uh, I will. That will be my easy forecast to say that. That's not going to make you a super forecaster. Read the entire book, then go to that. Okay. Now, uh, the book talks about what's called a modal super forecaster. This is not model. This is not M-O-D-E-L. This is M-O-D-A-L. That means what is the mode of the distribution of various types of forecasters? Okay. This is the most popular characteristics of all the forecasters. And I'm paraphrasing this from super forecasting, but most of these words are identical from the book. This is some of the personality traits we're looking at. What kind of an outlook should a person have to be a super forecaster? Well, you should always think that nothing is certain. You should not have this zero one type of a mindset, okay? Nothing is certain. Reality is extremely complex, okay? Uh, that should be the mindset that you should go with. You should not I mean, simplifying things is very good when you know things are not simple. Okay, that is what we're trying to talk about. What is your outlook? Okay, Then what happens? A lot of the times you think, oh, this is just meant to be. No, that's not the right outlook to be a super forecaster. What happens is not meant to be and does not have to happen. Okay, uh, That is a mindset that we're looking at. What about abilities and thinking styles? Okay, the, one of the things is that Beliefs are something that we need to test as hypothesis. Okay, these are not something that we just protect as treasure. Okay, this is uh, this is the kind of thinking style that is very useful to be a super forecaster. These these super forecasters are typically intellectually curious. They like to do puzzles and they like mental challenges. Generally, they look into themselves. They're very introspective and they're also self-critical. They make a decision and they check how well they're doing and so on. They're generally comfortable with numbers. Uh, then another thing that we're talking about is what kind of methods they apply. Now, this is very, very important. A lot of us have this habit of, you know, to take, uh, just take one method and apply it to everything, especially those of you working in data science tend to do this a lot. But it, that's not a good thing. You should not be wedded to either a method or an idea or an agenda. You should keep trying various different things. You should be open. And you should, they, the typical super forecaster, typically take their time to look at several viewpoints. And from time to time, they change their minds. This is very important when facts change, okay? You don't, uh, you know, you may be a fan of a tennis player, but when things change, you need to change your mind. Think, oh, okay, so be okay with, okay, player B may be winning at this point of time. Okay, that's what we're talking about, okay? And then you also have to check these cognitive and emotional biases. This is what I was saying. If you're a big fan of a player, you're, you're biased towards thinking that that person is going to win. So you need to check for these emotional and cognitive biases when you make these forecasts. The other thing is work ethic. Uh, super forecasters have what's called a growth mindset. I'm going to keep it very simplistic, but you can go read up. There are tons of articles on growth mindset. These are people who think that, you know, I can learn and grow. Okay, this is very important to do. And the other thing is grit. Stick with something practice a lot, try many times, but keep sticking with it. Sticking with it means not in the thinking. 
sticking with solving that problem. Okay, don't give up too easily. Okay, so so that's great. All right. So we've said a lot of things, uh, uh, but I would wish to conclude by saying this, and I, I, I know I've gone a little bit over time. As human beings, we just love to know about the future. We like to fantasize about the future, or at least dream about it. There's so many movies made about it, whether it is a utopian future or a dystopian future. There are a bunch of movies, science fiction as well. And we all know this name, Nostradamus. If you've not uh, check it out, uh, made a lot of predictions way back when, and we all try to see. You know, we're very interested in seeing. Okay, did they actually predict the coronavirus? We can take a look. We all have not we all. Some people, I should say, have tremendous obsession for astrology. But you know, uh, we like to we listen to that. What's going to happen this week? The guy comes on TV and says, "Okay, the, this is going to happen to these types of people," and so on. We really obsess about that. So this is an important item for, for everybody, but it's hard to do, okay? But how do you become good at it? Well, one thing is you have to try to learn the art and science of forecasts. And uh, you know, first thing is make sure that you know how to deal with uncertainty. You very clearly understand what assumptions go in when they're made. And this is very critical. This is an art to pick models. It comes with practice, so that's a very good thing. You pick the right model then reduce our inherent biases. If you can do that, uh, that's my takeaway in terms of how do you become a good forecaster, whether or not it is time series based. Okay. Now, those of us that are in the time series side of things, here are some practical ideas that I would like to give. There is a website called Kaggle.com. There are tons of competitions and data sets. You just go take a look at that. You can practice. Okay. I would highly, highly recommend that you go about uh, go there and, and do some practice. Now, those of you that you know have done some amount of forecasting know that well. When you make a forecast, I don't know what is the ground truth. Okay, I don't want to wait for the next month or the next day to actually see what it is. Then what you can do is you can create your own data set. You can create simulations. And this is how I recommend practicing. Practice by actually simulating some data sets where you actually know the ground truth, and you can easily check. Okay. So with this, I do hope that uh, you all get uh, some type of an interest in this topic of forecasting, as well as understand why it is not particularly you know, trivial to do this and have some appreciation for folks that actually do some of these forecasts. And uh, you know, we will be ready to take some questions. So I'm going to uh, uh, flip and look at all the questions and just give me a second. Okay, so let me uh, now look and uh, see what questions we have. Uh, okay, so we have a bunch of questions. Uh, I will go through some of these questions and uh, those of you that left me an email address, I will respond to you guys uh, by email. Okay, so uh, the first question is uh, how to forecast stocks. And is it safe, safe to get into stock market trading with the help of forecasting? Good. I am for sure not qualified to say anything about forecasting stocks, but let me just say a few things. Uh, uh, what I've read is that, yes, it is very important in, when it comes to forecasting, these exogenous variables are extremely important. Because if you just look at the time series of just the stock itself, it is not very useful. It's not possible to do forecasting. You have to do some, the exogenous variables. Uh, Warren Buffett, who is uh, the, known as the Oracle of Omaha, uh, actually does a great job of this. Uh, he's, you know, he and other people also essentially suggest that you study your, uh, your, your data and then you know, study it over a large period of time. Uh, look at your entire history, look at a few stocks look at companies that are doing well and understand why the stocks are going up. So this exogenous variables that I was talking about, you really have to figure out what is the, what are those variables? Many times you don't know that, okay? Uh, definitely the coronavirus is an exogenous variable that nobody would have used, that's for sure. However, there are some others that you could, right? So, uh, so you, could, you could take a look at them uh, in order to look at uh, the forecasting stocks. Uh, so is there any uh, there are questions that are related to NPTEL? I'm going to have the NPTEL folks answer that. It's a question that I don't know the answers to. I, I, I'm not, you know, I've just been invited by NPTEL. I don't know the technical details about certification and so on. Okay, 
Uh, the, the next question is, uh, could you explain the topic or the title of the lecture? Because the topic is a bit tricky. Uh, I, 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 I appreciate your sympathies. Yes, this topic is definitely tricky. Uh, and, uh, you know, when we say the word forecasting, it means different things to different people. Some people think uh, of this as simply like what an astrologer would do versus time series forecasting. My intention was to combine both the time series style of forecasting and these forecasts, we want to forecast way into the future. What is life going to look like in 2050 and, and so on so that you, know, you can make good decisions. I do want to say that there are those types as well. I didn't do justice to that. And... Um, I think the super forecasting book does a phenomenal job of actually telling you how to do those types of forecasts if that is something that you're interested. The question is, uh, uh, okay, the questions on very technical items like bias various uh, trade-off when doing model prediction. So essentially we are, uh, I, will, I will address those types of questions uh, offline if you've given your email address. Uh, but you know, this, this thing is, available quite easily on the web as well because this tends to be a little bit technical for the audience that I'm looking at. Okay, so how to check if a forecast is valid? Uh, I, I know I talked about it. Uh, however, let me just re restate this. Now, if you make a point forecast, it's not difficult to check if it is valid because you look at the how accurate it is by seeing the actual value. But when you do a probabilistic forecast, when you give a probability, it's harder. So you have to collect a lot of data and then see. So in some sense, even while making, you know, probabilistic forecasts, what they say is you have to collect a lot of forecasts and see how well they've done. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, is there a way to, the que another question is, is there a way to determine what features resulted in a given forecast among all the input features? Okay. If this, this question is what are good features to select, a lot of the machine learning algorithms actually, especially if you do uh, uh, you know, things like, uh, Python and so on, there, there are uh, libraries that will tell you what features. I mean, the feature selection will essentially tell you what are the important features, what are not. But if we just look at the forecast as a layperson, no, you cannot tell what features went into that forecast. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm just looking through the question. A lot of these are comments, which I appreciate. Uh, how do you calculate population? So that's the question. How do you calculate? Uh, uh, oh, I mean, not not. I, I now I'm understanding the question. It's not actually human population, but how do you calculate what is the population uh, that is there? Now the population is not easy to calculate. You typically have samples, and uh, you use that to actually get. Now I am generally assuming that uh, the samples are well taken. If you've not uh, you know, we talked a lot about that in my previous uh, presentation uh, on uh, uh, on lies, dam lies, and statistics. Please look at that. We talk a little bit about sampling there. Uh, okay. How can a forecaster foresee problems like coronavirus or COVID-19 and lockdown so that the forecast will be uh, will be accurate? Now, this is a phenomenal question and a very very difficult question. Okay. Uh, and if there was a way for us to predict the coronavirus, uh, we could have. But I think going forward, I think what a lot of us will do is we will say, okay, it is not unusual for us to prepare for the worst. So this is more of a decision making under uncertainty situation. Now, given that I'm aware that something tremendous could happen, how am I going to be careful in terms of, you know, several things in terms of uh, you know, uh, money, maybe saving, having a little bit of savings. It could be other things as well, stocking up a little bit more and so on. Yes. So, so in some sense, it's not possible to predict that it's, uh, I, I don't think it's even anyone can even predict something like a COVID-19 situation, but you could be fairly prepared for something like that. So that's kind of what I was trying to say. All right. Uh, Okay, what makes super forecasters better than others in predicting world environment events and what strategies are followed by them? I think my maybe this question came up earlier than when I came to the last slide and they kind of tell you what type of uh, personalities are, uh, are, are very useful. Uh, it kind of talks about it. So I'm going to presume that that addressed that question. Uh, 
Uh, okay. Uh, now, this is interesting. Uh, there's a question which I'm going to paraphrase. That's saying the Indian media, they keep saying, you know, the Americans said this or the uh, Oxford University said this. This was done in Singapore. Why are they not quoting someone in India? I, 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 and I think I know where the question is coming from, but let me rephrase this. Why are they saying a lot of that? They are essentially, you know, remember they had a slide that said something like, you know, if somebody is a, uh, a considered an, uh, you know, a, a, an expert or a, a pundit, you're thinking, oh, uh, we're going to believe them a little bit more. I, I, I just think it's a tactic for people to believe. I'm sure there are everybody in India is doing as good a prediction as any of these guys can do, frankly. All right. Uh, and uh, what are some of the other questions? Uh, Whoa, this question I was not even seeing coming. This is a wonderful question and maybe should be... Uh, <laughs> can an astrologer become better in uh, his craft by following data science or forecasting techniques and vice versa? Ha, this, is, this, is, this, is a, this is a very funny question. It's very nice. I, I hope so. I mean, for, fortunately, it's called astrology. So it's this ology in there. It's science. So I'm sure they can become better following data science and forecasting techniques. I'm sorry, I'm just saying this as a one-liner. Uh, but can a forecaster become a better astrologer? Uh, I, I, I would hope so. I would hope so. And I think that is kind of the idea here. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, how do I predict changes in land use over time? Oh, this is very good too. So now again, now whenever you look at futuristic predictions, sometimes the historic data is not necessarily a, a great thing to use. Okay? And, and we're trying to look at policies and so on. And we're talking about in 2050, uh, you know, what are the various uh, things that we might see. You should also take into account other factors. It is, is, it is possible to predict, it is difficult to predict. Okay? Uh, I do want to say about land use and so on. Uh, uh, okay. Okay, so uh, uh, I think I will, uh, I will conclude here by just saying, uh, talking about this very last uh, comment. Uh, which says that uh, how does one go about understanding seasonality or time cycle changes over decades or centuries? Now, this is a very, very uh, interesting and important aspect because over centuries, you don't have the kind of data. In fact, a lot of people say, you know, those data might even not even be you know, totally true or there could be a lot more errors and so on. Who knows? Even now, the data could have errors. And uh, the granularity of data and the accuracy of data actually changes quite a bit over time. And I think a lot of the other features also go go hand in hand with this. You know, the, the personality situations and uh, the way we were um, uh, the way we were uh, using these models. And that's why the modeling part is very important. A lot of these models, by the way, the exponential smoothing model, for example, smooths out uh, past uh, behavior and uses more of the current situation and so on. Now. As a matter of fact, that may not be a good thing. You know, but people are probably looking at uh, very historical uh, information. If there is data available, something can be done. If not, it becomes more tricky. Uh, it's, this is not uh, necessarily very easy. 